Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. So, welcome to the Mindvine Podcast. My name is Daryl Mathers, and uh, I'm actually by myself today. I usually have my co-host Chris Bovey with me, but he's away, so it's just me. Um, but I'm lucky enough to be joined by a pair of distinguished guests. Uh, we have from Health Quality Ontario, Dr. Joshua Tepper, the President and Chief Executive Officer at Health Quality Ontario. Welcome. And we have Dr. Phil Klassen, Vice President of Medical Affairs. I know we have multiple other titles, but that's the one I chose to, uh, to tackle today. You're the VP of Medical Affairs at Ontario Shore, so welcome to you as well. Thanks. So we are here today. We, we just got uh, finished a presentation that Dr. Klassen did on the quality standards adoption in mental health. Uh, that is a partnership with Health Quality Ontario. And I'm wondering at first, uh, Dr. Tepper, if you can tell us a little bit about your organization. Great. Well, good afternoon, and thanks for having me, and thanks to Phil for being here today. Uh, great leadership. Uh, Health Quality Ontario is an arm's-length provincial agency of government, and our remit is complex but simple to state, which is to just help improve the quality of care for all Ontarians. And we, again, do this in a number of ways, through looking at the evidence, through supporting quality improvement, through data and reporting at the system level, but also at the individual provider level, and by working hand-in-hand with patients to understand what does better care look like and what do we need to do to get there. And Dr. Klassen, I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about your presentation today and kind of introduce our audience to the quality standards that... uh, I know you've been a huge part of in unveiling with uh, Health Quality Ontario. If you can talk about the standards and your presentation today a little bit. We think the quality standards for mental health are very exciting. Um, health Quality Ontario obviously has been the principal driver here. Uh, they've had some partner organizations in the uh, formulation of which um, diagnoses are going to be the uh, first three, and that is to say depression, dementia, and schizophrenia. But the development of the standards has been very, very exciting. I think it's exciting because um, it really ushers in um, an era of unprecedented opportunity uh, to to reduce variability and provide the best uh, evidence, today's best evidence, to the largest number of patients. And also to put the knowledge of what that best evidence is into the hands of the patients through the plain language uh, piece that HQO has put together. In terms of a summary of my presentation, it was uh, really focused on implementation challenges. As I mentioned in the presentation, we're trying to bridge a a very big gap uh, in in most cases, in the cases of most organizations, between what the evidence says we should be offering and what we are currently offering to people with these three as principal diagnoses. Uh, So the implementation comes with many great challenges, but Uh, It gives us an opportunity, I think, to innovate and to feel really excited about bringing the best treatments to the table for sufferers with these three particular conditions and their natural supports. What does the, I mean, either one of these or both of these can kind of tackle this one, but you develop these standards. What does it actually going to look like or what does it mean for people who are going to be receiving care uh, for one of these three areas moving forward? What do you hope it achieves, I guess, Mm -hmm. for that from that patient perspective? Well, what we hope is, A, it provides greater clarity about what does great care look like. And for some patients uh, and for some providers, there'll be no change because they're already doing it. And I think that's going to be the case time and time again, uh, is that people will read the statements, caregivers, patients, healthcare uh, professionals, and say, yep, check, check, check. But there will be places where they'll say, you know what, I'm not sure we're doing that all the time or I'm not sure we're doing that as well as we could. And that becomes the gap that we can work to close. And uh, I think, again, each standard is consisted of sort of 12 to 15 very plain language, easily accessible statements. Uh, And so it's just a really nice focused look at a really important clinical condition. One of the things when I was going through, you have a great patient resource. You made reference to it in your in your presentation today um, in the use of plain language for you know people outside of the mental health care field. 
the resource is great, and, I, and you go through it, and it's, it talks about understanding and planning your care and what a treatment plan is and, and goes through medication and, and kind of what your rights are as a patient with this kind of diagnosis and, and what to expect. And I kind of, like, when I was going through it, it's kind of like the what to expect when you're expecting, you know, for pregnancy, right? When I'm going through it with my wife and we're starting our family, you, you know, you're going through this life change and you're hungry for information. You want to consume information. But that hasn't been readily available in mental health care. And you made reference to it when we were talking just beforehand that this is how innovative an initiative is. Like we are the first in Canada to kind of go through this kind of process. And um, can you talk a bit about how we actually got here? It seems like, you know, it seems like we got here quickly. I know it hasn't been that case, but, um, you know, it's like mental health and hasn't been something that's been on the forefront of our society in terms of a, a priority issue. But now it seems to be the, the tide is turning. Well, as we heard in, during the presentation, though, we, we haven't really quite gotten anywhere yet in the sense that we have, I think, some excellent uh, quality standards. And really, this is the best articulation of what people with these three diagnoses should be receiving uh, in Canada, uh, in my opinion, and no question. But now comes the real challenge of implementation, getting people to really change their organizations. So from, a, from the perspective of the, of the service user or their family, I think they will, they will need to uh, prepare for the fact that that may take a little time for the organizations to change their service offerings because this really is a big change. But they're empowered with the plain language summary to help drive that change. The other piece in addition to what we heard about a moment ago from Josh that I think is very important is I think we underutilize measurement in the everyday management of people, at least with mental health care, if not health care in general. And the other thing that I think that's so valuable that the quality standards bring to the table is you must bring more measurement to the table. And you must communicate those measurement issues and those outcome issues with the service users and their families. And I think that's going to lead to a degree of precision and a different kind of communication yeah. with patients and families than we've had previously. And it's something that's been happening in acute care too. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I love your example of the sort of a what to expect when you're expecting. Mm -hmm. A couple differences though. So first of all, this was done with patients. So this isn't just being delivered. Here's what the expert think. You can read it. Hope you like it. We've had patients involved in the topic selection. We've had patients involved in the development of the standards and the implementation plans uh, that go with it. So that is really, really important. And the other thing is it's freely available uh, and it's simple. You know, I sometimes worry a lot of the time we want patients engaged, we want caregivers to participate in care, uh, but we make it harder uh, because the, it's not in the right language, the, the text is too complex, uh, or we're asking people to, to wade through a huge volume of material. And these literally, you have a copy in front of you, these are what, two pages, inside out, easy to read, plain language, we're going to get them translated, completely free on our website, uh, and, and so highly accessible, and accessible through our partners. And, and I I think um, people want to be engaged in their care, but we have to make it as easy as possible for that to happen. I, I think actually it's even, it's even better than, than that in the sense that what you have is uh, the mirror image. You have, you have the strong statements, and then you have the mirror image that places the provider and the mm -hmm. patient or their natural supports or their family on the same page. Certainly there's, there's material out there, for example, for patients, but that material may be quite different from what that physician or nurse practitioner or other healthcare provider is reading. This is now coming from an authoritative source that says, these 12 statements are the statements, or 15 or what have you. These are the statements. It's the same statements for the service user and the provider. And I think that hopefully is gonna create um, a much better partnership uh, than we might have had thus far. One hymn book. Yeah. <laughs> The, you mentioned the patient involvement. How, uh, what were some of the ways that patients were able to contribute to the quality standards? So first of all, we open up. Uh, well, we have a panel of expertise that develop, and, and you know, Phil, you played such a huge leadership role in that, uh, to help develop them. And we have a, a competitive, open, transparent process, and we promote it widely uh, through our website, through other organizations with expertise in the area that we're looking at. And then we very actively solicit through patient groups, patient advocate groups in that clinical area. And, they, and we make it quite easy for them to sort of submit a nomination to participate. We try to address a lot of the barriers to participation. And then they're in literally from, from day zero uh, in the development. And then when we get to 
to a draft stage when the committees come up with a nice draft. We put that out wide open on the web. We push it out through organizations that would have an interest in that area, in this case, mental health. Um, and we say, listen, let us know what you think. And we push it again out through patient groups, out through organizations that work with patients, uh, and, and really just welcome all their feedback. So there's several checks along the way where they can participate. Patient engagement has been, it's more than just a buzzword now. I mean, it's, it's embedded in, in a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of organizations. You mentioned a couple of times, just through the implementation of these standards, you're going to have a, a whole different level of engagement to, to kind of pursue with uh, clinical providers and, and organizations. And is this going to, uh, you talked about it being a stand, like these standards being uniform language, uh, less open to interpretation in terms of expertise, like here are the statements, they're, they're consistent. Do you anticipate it being well received? Is the, are the 80-some sites that were on this, this presentation today a good indication that people are, are looking for this information, that they're, they're eagerly anticipating its arrival? Well, the, uh, just from my perspective, I've, I've given a similar kind of talk on a number of occasions in a number of different settings. And... Um, in fairness, in most of those settings, the, the attendees have been healthcare professionals, physicians and others. Um, they have been uh, very enthusiastic because when you talk about evidence, I mean, that's how you talk to, to professionals. You mm -hmm. talk to them about the best evidence and the best outcomes for their patients. I think what they're anxious about is the magnitude of the change and whether they're going to need extra resources. The message I try to give is I, I really think it's doable. I mean, we've done it here. If we can do it here, I think it's doable. And secondly, I, I think it's such an opportunity to innovate. Uh, you know, it's because we have we if we're going to keep our access commitment, we're going to need to get more innovative. And this is the great challenge. The other thing I think it does is it may help create a better system. People are going to have to partner, I think, to really manage all of those statements effectively, especially if they're from smaller organizations. And those partnerships, of course, are the kinds of things we'd like to see more of. I think the, you know, one of the things people hear uh, is, is there still going to be flexibility? Is there still an ability to be patient-centered? And the answer is absolutely. There's nothing about these statements or these standards that inhibit you from providing absolutely patient-centered care. Uh, what it does is it provides a common starting point for the healthcare professional and the patients to come together. And then together they can sort of say, you know what, given where you are, given what your preferences are, given your interests, whatever it is uh, around the care and, and the course of your care, you know what, we're going to make some thoughtful differences. But they should be thoughtful, uh, thoughtfully constructed uh, conversations. And again, what people want reassurance on is that these are not going to be sort of used to eliminate that very important uh, provider-patient relationship. You know, that physician-patient relationship is so central uh, to it, the team-based nature of care uh, that's so central. These should only augment it. They should only clarify it. They should only facilitate it uh, and in no way sort of remove that really unique relationship that makes healthcare uh, rewarding and successful. And I would add, uh, I completely support every comment that was made there. I would add that ethically, I mean, I think we, and I think also from a recovery framework, we're really obliged to present what we believe is the best evidence to patients. Um, but of course, uh, you know, patient choice is still central to this. There are explicit references to patient choice in quite a number of the statements. Use of a decision aid to bring the practitioner and the, and the patient together. Um, providing information in the dementia standard, in the depression standard. Um, it is really about uh, our ethical duty to provide the best evidence, but with very much of an atmosphere of dialogue. I think it's particularly important in mental health. Like we'll have standards on topics right across every clinical medical condition. You can imagine over time we'll slowly build it up. Uh, but I think in mental health it was a really important place to start. It's a place where stigma, where power differential, uh, where the, uh, an individual's experience with the healthcare system has often been very negative. Uh, you know, there's just a very difficult history there. Uh, collectively, I think, that we should acknowledge. And so I think starting in this space uh, was a very uh, important decision, and I'm glad we did it, um, because I do think it's an area where this type of communication, this type of partnership, this type of leveling uh, a, a sort of hierarchy onto a common starting point uh, is, is just really, really essential and empowering to patients who historically, I think, we should all agree and would agree, uh, it, it's been difficult at points. 
as as you move forward and and look to grow these these standards or implement these standards in other places in Ontario, uh, Ontario Shores is already down that road. So how how valuable a tool is it for you uh, and Health Quality Ontario to have Ontario Shores already down this road as you kind of go to other organizations and and share expertise and experiences and implementation? Oh, I think it's critical, right? You need you need the pioneer. You need that champion. You need the the brave one to go first, uh, because people see the, they they get excited by the concept. Then they see the product and they're excited and stimulated. And then there's that inevitable, but is it doable? Can it be done? And the answer is, look, you know, it can be done. And that's partly why we're here today. It's partly why I'm so excited when I hear Phil say, you know, what I've given talks like this in several places, uh, because people. People are always looking to for that pioneer uh, and the proof of concept, right? We have a, here's a concept, here's the proof of concept that shows this really does work. And uh, it, it's wonderful to have uh, such a, a leader, uh, not just in Phil, but in an organization like this one. And then now, of course, the, the, the fun part is not only going to be the implementation, but taking a look at outcomes. Um, you know, I think it'll take a while for us to gather some of that data because some of these interventions will take time to realize their true benefits. We know that, for example, from our Metabolic Monitoring Initiative and others, it will take months to years to show those benefits, some sooner than that. Um, but obviously what we really want, in addition to creating the standards and implementing the standards, is of course we want to be able to show that we're producing better patient outcomes, both in terms of experience, hopefully, and certainly in terms of uh, measures of how their clinical condition is doing. Well, I think it's wonderful, and you see a lot of people in the lecture theater today and online inspired by this. And um, in my experience, just seeing how far we've come in mental health care to see organizations working together, having patients involved, and creating something uniform that we can all kind of build on. So it's kind of a you know it sounds like a baseline for us to kind of move forward with. We've talked a lot about the product today and how powerful the product is. We've talked a lot about the importance of how that product, the standards, gets implemented. But, but I think you're right, the process can be very uh, catalyzing. And I think, again, it brings people in a room with a shared purpose uh, and allows new communities to, to form. And I think one of the things we're going to talk a lot about as these standards develop is communities of practice people who come together and say, well, how did you tackle this statement in the standard? How did you tackle this problem when it inevitably showed up? And, and just to be able to have that community uh, of people focused on a common hymn book, like I said earlier, I, I think that's what it happens. You know, these things are complex challenges that we would have solved them 20 years ago. Um, and, and so it will be a team effort. And I think the process here has started uh, some of that uh, teamness. Well, as we get, wrap up, I just want to promote a couple things. Uh, Dr. Klassen actually wrote a, a blog on the subject uh, a few weeks ago, and you can, you can uh, read that at mindvine.ontarioshores.ca. And uh, Dr. Tepper is very active on social media, so you can follow him at Dr. Joshua Tepper on Twitter, and you can visit hqontario.ca for more information on the quality standards for mental health. So thank you both for joining me, and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Games in